my name is Miranda Jones, and I'm an assistant professor here in the Department of Epidemiology. Um, and I want to welcome everyone to today's Lunch Learn Link, sponsored by the Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center and the Maryland Cigarette Restitution Fund. Um, I also want to welcome our online viewers at the University of Maryland and Howard University. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. A quick reminder for everyone who, are, who is here in person, uh, Nicole will be on the side uh, to provide tickets for the lunch that's after today's seminar, and that'll be provided in the gallery just outside the lecture hall. Uh, so today, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Galiacitos, who is an associate professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Um, Dr. G uh, was born and raised in Baltimore City, and prior to coming to Hopkins, he completed his undergraduate degree at Temple University and his medical degree uh, from the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Uh, he completed his residency in internal medicine at Hopkins Bayview Medical Center, as well as serving a one-year assistant chief of service. Uh, he went into pulmonary and critical fellowship at the Hopkins School of Medicine and the National Institutes of Health. And finally, he completed two master degrees, uh, one in health sciences from Duke University School of Medicine and one in tobacco treatment at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. So today, he'll be talking about implementing the chronic disease model for tobacco dependence. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to our center. Excellent. So I'm going to come up. Is the microphone OK? Everything, I hit the one button. Something's green. And we're good? Excellent. So thank you guys for allowing me to be here. By the way, if you guys ever go give a talk and someone in the talk unintentionally promotes you, just let it go. So I'm still in this. It's professor, but if my, if my uh, division head here is the associate and they want to pay me as that, that's fine. I will not argue that. Um, but yeah, no, it's a, it's a delight to be here today. And given the intimate crowd, that may be a good or bad thing, because I'm, I still like to call on people in the crowd. It is a, we're all family here, so don't feel pressured. But what I'd like to go over, you know, in, in the cutting edge 2019 in medicine and in science, this is great technologies at the forefront. We're coming up with fantastic therapies, fantastic cures, and so forth, right? This is an exciting time to be a scientist, a public health official, to be a physician, nurse, and so forth. However, a 100-year-old problem is still killing our patients, right? A preventative problem. More than opioids, more than gun violence combined, right? When I hear so much energy being put forth, and rightly so, I sit back and go, well, my problem is still the number one preventative cause of death. And in Baltimore City, it kills more of our citizens than gun violence and opioids combined. And I say all this because I feel like the urgency and the attention that this deserves and warrants was great in the 90s and really has subsided. And with that said, to some extent, we're going to start seeing a, either a resurgence of the use of these traditional cigarettes, um, or we're also going to see kind of the inability to impact the patients that need it the most. I run the uh, tobacco treatment clinic over at Johns Hopkins Bayview, and the patients that come and see me to try to quit smoking, those are, in my opinion, the most drastic and most severe end of the spectrum of tobacco dependence and nicotine addiction. Those are the ones that public health policies really can't make an impact on. Public health policies have been fantastic. They made great impacts and strides in lowering our smoking consumption rate. But at the same time, we can't forget those who are, are greatly addicted. We need to manage those patients. So this is why I decided to change my talk from tobacco dependence management and discussing the chronic disease model to why can't my patient quit smoking? And when I give this talk to other healthcare professionals, right, because I'm so not knowing everyone's background here, I usually like to do a show of hands, right? I say, how many doctors and nurses out there have asked their patients to quit having diabetes? Probably no one, right? You shouldn't. You should talk to your patient. I've diagnosed you. Here's the management strategy we'll lay out, and we're going to do this together. The responsibility of diabetes management is off your shoulders and on our shoulders. We're going to do this collectively and do it together. Same question asked, like how many doctors have asked their patients to quit having high blood pressure? And again, no one raises their hand. Then I say, well, how many of you have asked your patients to quit having tobacco dependence? And in the phrase you can say is just to quit smoking. And everyone raises their hand, and I say, well, what did you do to manage that? Right? And it, it's almost silent. And I'm guilty of this too. When I was an intern, I definitely talked to my patients for one minute, if that, telling them to quit. Here's the quit number. Good luck. And one of the most awe-striking moments I've had in my career, especially starting this tobacco treatment clinic, is a patient really well spoken and said, doctor, 
actually said, Doc, he's like, quitting smoking is actually really easy. And I've done it thousands of times. And that reminded me at that moment, right, it's not the quitting smoking that we should hang our hats on. It's do we do a successful job of keeping our patients tobacco independent? And that is really where we fail. So let's go over this. I have a few cases I'm gonna just talk out loud. And again, not knowing people's backgrounds, you're welcome to weigh in, share your thoughts and so forth, what you'd like to know more about this patient and so forth. So these are three patients who have all come to my clinic before. This is a 72 year old retired librarian. She comes to see me for smoking cessation. She, her past medical history is significant for depression, anxiety, and asthma. Is there anything more? Obviously I didn't give you a lot of details, but she's come to see you specifically for smoking. Right? and coming off and quitting. And what I try to challenge every individual who's learning from me is, again, you can't just copy and paste right, one algorithm to another and expect it to work. That's equal care, but not equitable care. So if you want to know this person a little bit more, what other questions do you want to learn about her as a person who smokes? And if the audience does not raise hands, I may call on people, so just be prepared. <laughs> Young man, you're, you're staring very attentively. What more would you like to know about this patient? And we're, we're amongst friends. One thing you'd like to know is to know uh, their occupation. All right, so she's a librarian and she's retired. Like what's the day during the day like? Do they ah, I see, what, what are they doing during the day? And you know what, I'm gonna to try to continue reading your mind. Maybe you're, you're trying to ask that in order to understand, well, when are they smoking? Like what are their triggers to smoking? So fantastic, what is your name? Samuel. Samuel, so Samuel asks a great question. So when I get patients into my clinic, I spend up to 45 minutes with them because I ask what Samuel has asked as well. I go over their triggers to smoking. You'll see later on, the reason why that's so significant is the way nicotine acts on the brain creates a conditional response for us. Us here sitting in this room, we are conditioned to a variety of things. When you walk into the kitchen, I guarantee you, you get a little hungry. When you walk into the bathroom, I guarantee you, you do not get hungry. If you eat in the bathroom, no judgment, but you know that's not kind of the norm behavior. But conditioning happens in a lot of mammalian brains. That's Pavlov's dog, for instance. Conditioning, where you take a one kind of a, a um, sensory input and you align it with another uh, outcome, right? The uh, bell ringing, he's gonna get food, and suddenly the brain becomes conditioned to that. So you're asking for the time of the day, you know, what are the moments that she, uh, triggers her to smoking? That's fantastic, because what you're trying to find out is what she's conditioned herself to smoking. Is it a time of the day? Is it after certain foods, after certain meals? Is it with certain activities and so forth? And patients will tell you this pretty extensively. After coffee, I'd like to have a cigarette. After alcohol, I'd like to have a cigarette. After food, I'd like to have a cigarette. In the morning, first thing when I wake up, I'd like to go and have a cigarette, right? You like to get that impression of the times that the patient is smoking. That big category is called a smoking phenotype, right? In order to understand who this person is as someone who smokes. What other questions would you like to ask this librarian? Well, I'll take one more audience response. Um, I would like to say that in my mind, her anxiety and whatever triggers that anxiety and then her depression, she's using smoking to cope with those two things. It's a coping mechanism. Uh, self-medicating and she's got asthma mm -hmm. she should never be near anyone who smokes and she should not be smoking. so you're, you're spot on right there are definitely influential comorbidities especially mental health uh, uh, specific ones that really confound the ability for people to quit smoking so what we'll learn in a little bit is why that happens but depression so when I take my notes I write the most confounding influential activity or uh, comorbidities for her are going to be her depression and anxiety. And the challenge here is actually nicotine is an incredibly great molecule to help with the symptoms of depression and anxiety. This is not me promoting right. cigarette smoking, but we have to be, you have to take a page out of Sun Tzu's Art of War. You have to know your enemy. You have to understand the cigarette's impact on the patients because if smoking felt like getting hit on the head by a hammer, everyone would have quit. But clearly it's providing a benefit for her. So you want to explore those thoughts even more. Fantastic. We have a 32-year-old tenant comes to free tobacco treatment clinics at a housing unit. His past medical history is schizophrenia. What else would you like to know about this patient? Samuel, you cannot use your answer of, I like to know when he smokes throughout the day. So just in case if you wanted to copy and paste that throughout. What about right here on this side? What would you like to ask him? Oh, fantastic. So support system is a huge. So in my clinic, 
doing a retrospective analysis, right? Granted, it's cross-sectional. We've recognized that if patients are coming into my clinic with an obvious loved one, family member, friend, and so forth, more likely to quit, right? Because what the support system does is helps reaffirm your strategy and your plans. So that's great. Is there a confounder that you can see? Obviously, I didn't write a lot of words, but is there an immediate confounder to this patient's uh, patient's past medical history that will influence his ability to quit smoking? Schizophrenia, right? And you'll, we'll go over that in, uh, to some extent as well. And then finally, I have an 18 year old comes to see you for electronic cigarette usage and desire to quit, newly diagnosed with hypersensitivity pneumonitis. For the pulmonology fans out there, thank you. Um, it's, this is really bad. So what, would you, what more do you want to know about this patient? What, I heard someone say something. 18. Yeah. yeah. No, this is, it's a, this is an epidemic we're, we're in. Yeah, Samuel. I think I'd like to know who he hangs out with. Right, the peer pressure influences, right? And not even just a, a physical presence, but also social media presence. This, while we're not going to get into this too extensively, yes, sir? Yeah, how long has it been using and what's in the Fantastic questions, fantastic questions. And I would take it a step further, not just ask them what's in the e-cigarette, because remember, since it's not really strongly FDA regulated, they don't know. And more importantly, it's also very misleading. They're like, oh, well, nicotine's only 2% of the content. That's what it says on the bottle, right? Do you know how much nicotine percentage is part of the cigarette? It's less than 1%, right? So that's a lot of nicotine in an electronic cigarette. Then you also want to ask them, do you pop the pod, right? Do you manipulate it? Do you add your own contents in it? Because I had a patient do that, right? She, she's like, oh, I'm going to go one th through one pod a month. But within every two days, she manipulates it, adds a little bit more nicotine juice. This is an incredibly dire situation that we're faced in. We're not going to go into it too much, but it's reminding me of a literature in, in the late 1990s that patients after cabbage surgeries, meaning a cardiothoracic surgeon took these patients, they broke open their chests, right, to revascularize the heart. Those patients within a year went back to smoking, right, because no one's implemented a model to help them quit. The patients who have survived their vaping-induced lung injuries, guess what we're finding? They're back to vaping. Right? Again, know our enemy. This is not making people feel judgmental. This is not making people feel stigmatized. If we do that, we're just gonna continue worsening the situation. And right now, smoking is one of the biggest health disparities we face. And a lot of it, if you talk to patients who smoke, it's because of the stigmatization. It is one disease that they're happy to lie to their physicians about. So we have to be pro-smoker, anti-smoking. We have to be one with our community and shift the responsibility solely off their shoulders and onto ours in order to implement this chronic disease model. So why do people smoke? For those, how many people have taken organic chemistry? You gotta put your hands up with pride. I know online, people are like, I did, Dr. G. So this structure is not meant to just fancy you all and be like, oh my gosh, good, methyl, you know, a methyl subgroup and so forth. But it's meant to represent, right, again, know your enemy. Nicotine mimics in structure acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is one of the most, if not the abundant neurotransmitter we have in our brain. So if it looks like it, it's likely to hijack its receptors. If it's gonna hijack its receptors, because there's no such thing as a nicotine receptor until nicotine converts it into that, right? Prior to that, it's just an acetylcholine receptor. So we need to be cognizant of, well, where are these acetylcholine receptors? Because if you know where they're acting in the brain, then you can start talking about what, what kind of influence is that gonna have on the person, right? And the other thing about this nicotine molecule, and I'll, forgive me, we'll see if I go over this pretty extensively later, is nicotine in and of itself, you have to again know your enemy. The cigarette and the electronic cigarette, their design is not meant to just give you nicotine, right? Because you could say a patch can do that, nasal sprays can do that, why doesn't a tobacco company just invest in them? It doesn't invest in them because look at the way nicotine is delivered through the inhalation process. This huge uptake can only happen if you apply some of the world's greatest chemistry experiments to the nicotine molecule. So going back to the nicotine molecule, if I can demethylate this, right, meaning knocking off this methyl group, I can get the nicotine to cross your lung blood barrier and your blood brain barrier exponentially faster, right? And you can do that with heat and ammonia in a traditional cigarette as, as long as the other heavy metals and so forth. In an electronic cigarette, you do it with heat, right, because there's a heating coil, and you do it with the formaldehyde or do it with the propylene glycol and the glycerol that are added to the pods and cartridges, right? You can do that, right? Why? Why do I need to demethylate the nicotine? Why do I make it, need to make it more efficient to be given to the patients? 
because in order to hijack those acetylcholine receptors and create a rewiring in your prefrontal cortex and your mesolimbic areas of your brain, I'm not trying to fancy you with neuroanatomical parts, but these are really important parts of the brain. The mammal's brain has really not changed them throughout evolution. A dog's brain, a human's brain really are pretty similar around these subject matters because they are designed for survival. They condition you through your senses that you're taking in from your environment to understand what actions you need to be doing in certain environments, especially if they're specific to survival. One of the most easiest things to understand, unless you're a smoker, is eating. You understand you are conditioned to eat at very specific moments that you get cues from your environment. If you smell something, you might you know, get a little whiff of the pizza, you're gonna get a little hunger, right? Your brain is conditioned to take on those environmental cues and, and let you know you should be doing an action. This is what nicotine does, but you can only do that to the brain if I deliver nicotine at a fast pace, at a high concentration, and at a chemically enhanced manner that it can hijack those acetylcholine receptors, right? So this is why tobacco companies don't invest in things like patches, nasal sprays, and so forth, because that goes through the venous return system, a lot of it gets metabolized by the liver, it's very inefficient to create an addicted person. So, delivery of nicotine is dependent on the cigarette and the cigarette's properties. But the rest of the nicotine, this component, this is dependent on your metabolism. Now this is beginning to answer the question of why my patient can't quit smoking. There was a study out of Scandinavia, right, those three European countries uh, up north that reviewed patients in the, let me see, in the 90s to investigate those who could quit cold turkey, right? Because, you know, why don't we patients, why can't they just quit cold turkey? Why can't they just put the cigarette down and further avoid it? What they found out though was when they took these patients' blood, right, and they sent it off to the lab, what they were investigating was for one of the most abundant enzymes that plays a role in nicotine breakdown, your CYP2A6. If you have a normal variance of the CYP2A6, a normal metabolizer, that's fine. It means you take a nicotine and probably within an hour it's gone. Some patients can be fast metabolizers, right? And actually this happens physiologically in women who are pregnant. That's why women who are pregnant usually smoke, they become a little bit more aggressive smokers and there's literature to support that because they're metabolizing nicotine much, much faster. But there are patients also with a wild variance of the CYP2A6 that makes them into slow metabolizers. So if you're a slow metabolizer of nicotine, meaning this nicotine concentration is hanging in your body for a much longer period of time, you are probably not gonna be an aggressive smoker. Right? You may be doing two or three cigarettes a day because that's all you really need to get the same effect as someone who may be a fast metabolizer and smoking 10 cigarettes in a day. Right? So what they found in the Scandinavian country was that over 95% of the patients who quit cold turkey had a variance of their CYP2A6 that made them slow metabolizers. So I say this because when patients say, I quit cold turkey, why can't you? I'm, I'm not dismissive of that. I love a community support, go for it. But this is so complex. There's intrinsic properties and extrinsic properties that are making it hard to quit. And for a lot of patients, like in, out of this study, and I'm trying to extrapolate to some extent, it could be a, not an oversimplification of someone's genes, right? Their genetics made them really not an aggressive smoker to begin with, and it was easy for them to walk away. So I say that to keep in mind because when we talk to our patients, it really isn't just quit. There are a lot of intrinsic issues that go on, and there's more genes, but in order for a compact hour lecture, I won't go over all of them. But this is the most influential one, is the CYP2A6. There's also CYP2D6, but it's uh, not as robustly studied as the A6 just because that's a, the most efficient enzyme to help with nicotine metabolism. So this is one of my favorite studies to go over the role of genetics. By the way, how successful were they in quitting? The odds ratio of quitting if you had this uh, genetic variance was one, your odds ratio of quitting was 1.74. Why I emphasize that is because the odds ratio of quitting using a nicotine patch versus a placebo is about 1.9, right? So having the genetic variance, right, puts you on par with a pharmacological agent to quit smoking. That's why there are people in the population that could just quit cold turkey, right? Again, some of them, it's because of their genetic variance. So why is nicotine so addictive? I already gave you the biggest insight is because of the acetylcholine structure similarities. But with that said, well, we need to know more. Where is it specifically acting in the brain that is driving this addiction, right? And nicotine works in the mesolimbic and prefrontal cortex areas, and we'll go over them in a little bit. But what it causes is a release of dopamine for a purpose of gratification. 
Meaning, think about if you're really hungry and that sense you get once you've eaten, right? There's a gratification to that, right? Your signals to eat have blunted, you're fine, you're content, your brain has made some rewiring at that moment, recognizing he ate in this place or she ate in this place with these kind of visual stimuli and this kind of acoustic stimuli and so forth, right? Your brain becomes Jason Bourne at this moment. I'm trying to make sure I'm still hip. You guys know who Jason Bourne is? Right, I get some head nods, great, fantastic. Or James Bond, I don't know, some James person. James Bauer, maybe, you know. Wasn't that 24, right? All right, good. A lot of Jameses, right? But your brain does that without you actually thinking about it. Your brain takes an inventory of everything that you did in order to shut off the signal that it was sending off for eating. And the same thing begins happening with nicotine. The second you begin to expose yourself at a young age and over and over and over again repeat it, usually in the same visual cues and, and environmental surroundings, your brain becomes wired to smoke in these settings with these visual cues, acoustic cues, olfactory cues, and so forth. It is a really diabolical situation, but this is also why I talk to my residents and physicians. I'm like, this is why your patient can look you in the eyes in a hospital and say, doc, I can quit smoking. I, I don't have a single craving. Right, because there's nothing stimulating this patient to smoke at this moment. He or she is not in an environment that they're accustomed to smoking. So 100% this patient can quit smoking, right? They're not being stimulated to do it. So this is the area of the brain, the prefrontal cortex with the mesolimbic area really broken down into a variety of other components that I take a fantastic drawing by um, science, the reference is there, I apologize. And this is uh, my efforts using like, you know, primitive PowerPoint uh, diagrams and so forth to give you what, it's, what is happening. So these are the acetylcholine receptors that have been hijacked. Once nicotine goes there, it stimulates the ventral tegmental area and what it does is it shuts off the signal that's happening in the nucleus accumbens. What happens prior to that though is that your thalamus begins to send a signal to your nucleus accumbens because it is getting visual, it is getting cues from the environment that you should be doing an activity, specifically just smoking for instance, right? So once say you're in your car with a lot of secondhand smoke hit, or third hand smoke specifically hitting your nose because this is usually where you're smoking, your nucleus accumbens rooted in the memory uh, of the thalamus, the nucleus accumbens will begin to send off a signal that will grow and grow and grow. And you're like, well, how back in the signal being? Think about when you are hungry. Think about when that signal continues to grow because you are getting stimulated to eat. Think about sitting in line at a cafeteria, smelling the food, and you, are, you know you're still another 30 minutes away from getting it, right? That's the best analogy that I can give you for how a smoker is feeling at these moments, wanting to smoke, right? They are being signaled and they're being told to do it. And what's most important about this is these changes, this rewiring, doesn't just drive what is called a habit, but it drives specifically what's called a compulsion. Compulsions are habits with emotions. So this is highly important because the patient who smokes will begin to associate smoking at very specific moments. Maybe they're doing it for depression. Maybe they're doing it for anxiety. That's very important because they're tying it with emotional cues. Right? Maybe they're doing it because they're there with their friends and so forth. That's highly important because breaking a habit is hard, but breaking a compulsion is even harder because it comes off insensitive if you try to tell them, well, you should just do a crossword puzzle. That's not, they're not using nicotine to occupy their brain. They're trying to do something else. Right? They're trying to get a very specific effect from it. So that's interesting panagis, but all right, a lot of things happen. Kind of maybe a shrug emoji. You're like, all right, tell me more. Like, well, like why, why does that make it hard for people to quit? Nicotine does a lot of changes in the mesolimbic area, right? It increases the nicotine receptor density. What I tell patients is that if you smoked for more than 10 years, you have more nicotine receptors in your brain than there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy. I have to emphasize Milky Way because I had a patient call me out. He's like, well, which galaxy? I was like, well, what is, how does that even matter? Like Andromeda versus Milky Way? I don't know, you, you pick. I haven't really tested the Andromeda one out. So with that said, that, I'm trying to give you an insight into how hard it will be for a lot of chronic persons who smoke. It is not gonna be just as easy as just to walk away from it and maintain that independence from it. So a lot of changes have in gene expressions down to a, a little bit more of a phenotype of the increased nicotine receptors. But there's two proteins that really are playing a role in this your uh, CREB protein and your delta FOS B. And for patients, uh, patients, for scientists and physicians and healthcare professionals who are really embedded in addiction medicine, these two proteins come up a lot because they are technically what usually drive addictions. So your CREB protein influences what's called tolerance, meaning every person who smokes probably start off with a cigarette 
and they build their tolerance up, up over time, depending on their genes, depending on their ability to take in this nicotine and so forth, and they usually get to like some plateau, a pack a day, half a pack a day, maybe two packs a day and so forth. But those same smokers, those persons who smoke, if they quit smoking, right, what do they tell you, right? They don't go back to smoking 10 packs a day, they go back to maybe a cigarette, and then two, and three. That's why we, we technically call it lapsing, right? Because you're not relapsing back to what you did, you're lapsing back to what you can tolerate now. Your Krebs protein goes away if you've stopped smoking. It completely drops off. So if a patient does lapse, he or she will build themselves back up. The Delta Fos B protein is the one that's more sinister. Your Delta Fos B is the protein responsible for the rewiring that happens in the brain, the arborization that makes all these connections to when and why you should be smoking. It makes those the second you begin to take in nicotine. And Delta Fos B is even more impacted if I can flush you with a ton of nicotine in a very quick amount of time. Those gene expressions for Delta Fos B get overloaded and flooded out. Delta Fos B does this throughout for a variety of reasons. And I say this, I'm gonna take a pause because really, well, why can't we just target Delta Fos B? We can't, we can't differentiate a Delta Fos B from eating, from smoking, so that's why it's been one of the most challenging things to create from a pharmacological agent. Back to Delta Fos B. It is responsible for all that rewiring that is happening. It is responsible for conditioning patients to take actions that have no association with survival and make them believe they need it. They're not saying to themselves, I need to smoke to survive, but that's what their brain signals are meant to be interpreted as. Your Delta Fos B is permanent. Asterisk. It's permanent if you began smoking before a very specific age. Does anyone want to take a guess when your prefrontal cortex really stops developing? Let me hear some numbers. I'm gonna call them people, so you can take one approach or another. Sir? 28. 28. Price is right. Who wants to go higher? Who wants to go lower? Lower. lower. How low, though? Don't say $1. That's not. <laughs> 25. So, you know, you would've, well, you would've, and Price is right, you're a bit over, so you would've lost, but that's still close enough that I'm like, I'm gonna congratulate you. 25. Now knowing that knowledge, knowing that if I can get you to smoke before the age of 25 to create wiring that is permanent, take a step back and ask yourselves why the e-cigarette companies, even without telling people, right, what age group are they really targeting? Teens. teens. And you're like, well, are they really targeting teens? I haven't seen a single commercial for it. You're spot on. You haven't, because you don't need commercials. Do you know where they're acting the most on? Social media. I'm answering your questions for you guys, I'm sorry. So I, uh, I have an undergraduate class, and I've asked them to do an experiment with me, right? They, went on, they created like a small account on Twitter and Instagram. If they post themselves vaping or use that, I'm not asking them to vape, like it's, it's just, you know, like there, it's a promotional vaping tweet that they'll put out. One of them with five followers got a thousand hits to their tweet. This is what they're doing. They are using social media in order to highly influence the youth to smoke. So you can say, well, I haven't seen a single commercial. Public health policies are, are doing great. We don't, that's, not what, that's not their angle. They know it's social media. I was on a, a news segment the other day on the local channel talking about our clinic helping patients quit e-cigarette use. A mother emailed me talking about her 18-year-old who died from vaping. And when I talked to her last night for almost an hour, she went, she, you know, she was a, she's a highly religious person. I say this because she, like, she's like, my kids haven't even seen alcohol. What ended up happening was his influence off of social media and she was flabbergasted because the jewels, everything, just she, it was always there. She didn't realize that those devices are e-cigarettes. The segment that I was on, the young person who gets interviewed, her e-cigarette is a watch. She pops it out and smokes. So long story short, I'm not going more into e-cigarettes, but it is targeted for the youth. And this is exactly what tobacco did as well. When it ran in its campaigns in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and 70s, and 80s, and to some extent still does with a reemergence of seeing actors smoke on movies and so forth. They're trying to get you young. Because if they can get you young, you're theirs for, for life. Can you stop smoking if you started young? You can, but it is, it is just harder. So your Delta Fos B. Let's take a quick thinking of what the anatomy of a cigarette is, because again, Taking a page out of Sun Tzu's book, The Art of War, Know Your Enemy. So, know the cigarette. How many people, this is my favorite question to ask, how many people have ever held a cigarette? I'm not implying that you smoked, I'm just saying have you held a cigarette, right? All right, I say this because like when I'm in med schools and I ask this question and like people are like, but like what, what bothers me is like, you know, you can ask a scientist, you can ask a physician, you can ask a nurse to go over 
staph aureus, right? And they'll go over the intricacies of the cell wall and so forth, right? You can ask them about HIV, and they'll go over the viral straining and so forth, right? We learn our enemies. But when I ask them to describe me the anatomy of a cigarette, they're like, I don't know, isn't that the end you hold and the end you light? I'm like, great, let's learn a little bit more. Because what is about the cigarette that makes it so efficient to be able to deliver nicotine? There's a variety of properties that you should be aware of that I'll mention three. One is the wrapping paper of a cigarette. Has anyone ever asked themselves, you know, early in the morning, you just wake up, you're stretching, you're like, my God, what's the difference between a cigarette, a cigarello, and a cigar? Anyone? No, maybe just me. So the difference between them is the wrapping paper, right? Specifically, what's called the porosity of the wrapping paper, meaning how many pores are in this wrapping paper, right? Cigarettes have a lot of pores. Cigars have almost no pores. And cigarellos have something in between. Why is that important? It's important because if I light my cigarette, and I take a drag, there's a lot of pores, a lot of air comes in. If a lot of air comes in, it dilutes the uh, nicotine concentration, right? So that's why the differences between a cigarette and cigar exist. Why is that important? It's important because in the late 1990s, when we sued the tobacco companies in order to create the CRF, the Cigarette Restitution Fund, as well as, well as taxing tobacco products, you may say, well, we won that. And I say, well, we, we kind of, it was middle ground, because we created a cigarette tax. We didn't create a cigar tax. We didn't create a cigarello tax. Do you know what's used more extensively in Baltimore City than Newports? Black and Mouths. Black and Mouths. Those are cigarellos, right? Those are dirt cheap, right? The cigarette, the tobacco companies were well aware of what they wanted to push and what they didn't want to push. And they're doing it now. When we were in Annapolis on February 27th, 2019, and we were pushing for e-cigarette limitations, they played with that. Those lawyers did legal gymnastics playing with the language to make sure it impacted a little bit, but not a lot, right? That's what they do. Right? Think about if you guys have ever asked your patients or people what brands they smoke, you'll be surprised at certain brands that they bring up, Westports. Westports are not Newports, they're not Marlboros, they're actually cigars, but they're packaged like a traditional cigarette. Right? And that's hard for me because cigars aren't as regulated, meaning I can't go on the government website and easily find the nicotine concentration. And more importantly, knowing the porosity of a cigar is almost none. They like that cigarette, cigar technically, they're getting a lot of nicotine, right? So if you ask me to help that patient quit smoking, I look at them and I say, this may take a few years. I'm serious, right? I mean, I'm being very honest with them. It takes a while to quit depending on their severity of nicotine addiction. Other properties, the ventilation holes that are right here, right? These are little lasered applied dots, right? So if you guys want to go out and buy a cigarette, I'm not promoting that, but it is really clever how they put them there. And you're like, well, why do they put these ventilation holes there? So when you submit a cigarette to the FDA, because there's a cap on nicotine of how much, uh, how much nicotine you put in a cigarette. We've done that since the mid-2000s. They take this cigarette, they put it against a the machine, they light it on fire, and they, the machine somehow takes a drag and they measure the nicotine in the air. With that said, and me introducing you earlier, the porosity component, think about what happens of how a smoker smokes, how a person who smokes smokes, right? They usually place their fingers right where that junction is, where the ventilation pores are. Unintentionally, it's not like they're like thinking about it, but they always put their fingers there, almost always. So putting your fingers and covering up the ventilation holes drives up the amount of nicotine those patients are getting, right? Even if they're not thinking about it. That's a clever thing that they have done. And it's not that like I know I'm letting the secret out. No, people have known this, but they've also fought the FDA from taking that into account when they measure the nicotine. Because they're like, you can't prove that's how everyone smokes. So, and finally, how it's stuffed. Right, the tobacco plant specifically itself. You can add more leaf or you can add more stem. Why this is a big difference is because leaf versus stem drives two components of the cigarette. One is the nicotine concentration and the other one is the burn rate. If you stuff your cigarette with a lot of stem, it means your nicotine concentration is a little bit lower and the burn rate is much faster, meaning if I light the cigarette, it self extinguishes pretty quickly. So this is why in my clinic, I don't talk about packs per year, I can tell you that if you're interested, I go over, tell me the brand and tell me how much. So if you buy USA Slims and you tell me you smoke three packs a day, I can understand why. It's not because you're that addicted. It's because after two puffs, it self-extinguishes. So you're on to the second cigarette. And then the third cigarette, just to get the same high or same impact as a new port 100 that has a burn rate of up to five minutes. So, because it's stuck predominantly with leaf. So, that's the difference between these twos, and that's why patients go from Newports to Mavericks because Mavericks are a little bit cheaper, or Marlboros or USA Slims because USA Slims are more cheap or cheaper, right? So it's how they stuff the cigarette by which components of the tobacco plant. The other thing too is the tobacco stem has a longer shelf life. With that said, as without knowing this, a lot of patients who smoke will tell you like the ones with you know the cheaper brands have packed really with a lot of stem. 
taste bad. So Newports that expire taste bad as well, but brands that always taste bad, it's hard to tell when they go bad. So anyway, those are the three properties I'd like to make you aware of because these are what influence how patients smoke, right? The porosity component, the, how they stuff the uh, cigarette itself, and the ventilation holes as well. All of this influences how much nicotine gets into a patient. This is huge because I told you earlier that nicotine in a high concentration, demethylated, chemically enhanced, sent into your body is going to begin to cause the arborization and rewiring in the mesolimbic area that creates the addictive properties moving forward, the conditioning. And all of these play a role in it. The other component of asking what brand of cigarettes not, and moving past that is look at just Marlboro. Marlboro, these are the top six brand, uh, uh, subgroups of Marlboro cigarettes. And you can see right off the bat that they all kind of differ in regards to nicotine concentration, which is in the dark blue, and the tar that's in there, which is the lighter blue. The tar, I take account because of two things. One is that's the real property that's causing the incidences of like cancer and emphysema and so forth. So I want to know how much tar is in there. But the, and tar also helps with the chemical enhancement of the nicotine. But tar acts in a different way as well. Not tar, tar is like, is like a umbrella catchphrase, right? Tar, the reason why it gets me concerned, when we were able to successfully win the battle of capping the amount of nicotine put into cigarettes, whenever we have legal battles against tobacco, that's great, but also take a step back to try to understand, well, why did we just win, right? Because tobacco really fights tooth and nail with their lobbyists to not lose. But if they let things go, they've let it go for a reason. So when we won this battle, that's when the tar concentration began to increase to some extent. And what they were just doing is adding nicotine-like products into their cigarettes that still reinforce the addiction. Things like cotinine and things like anabasine are added. It's also what's added in e-cigarettes that say I'm nicotine-free. They want to make you addicted, right? They don't want to just blow hot air into your lungs and call it a day. No, they're adding nicotine-like substances, right? And those are not regulated like nicotine is. So keep that in mind. And this is why I go over the tar concentration with my patients. It's hard to make note of how much is nicotine-like products and how much of it is really just used like as a heavy metal to be enhanced in the chemical experiment. But this is what they're doing, right? Tobacco has had some of the best scientists in the world create a cigarette that is the most efficient device to deliver nicotine. That's what they're trying to do, and that's what they keep devising and revising the cigarette overall. So identifying the dose of, the, of smoke is tough, right? How much nicotine is all in, in all of this, but this is what we try to do in our clinic. Because if I can understand the gravity and severity of a nicotine addiction, I can look a patient in the eye and give them some impression of if this is the agent that we want to use to help you quit smoking, right? A pharmacological agent, supplemented with counseling, supplemented with positive uh, interview, m motivational interview, and so forth. I give them a realistic timeline. And that's what we should do to our patients, right? Because we do that for every other chronic disease, right? Every chronic disease, if they have blood pressure of 200 over 180, I don't say take this med and it's gonna work overnight. I say it may take a month before we see your blood pressure well controlled. Someone comes in with a hemoglobin A1C of 16% and I start them on meds, I give them a timeline of when I think that's going to work, right? If someone comes in with stage four lung cancer, I give them a timeline of what I'm expecting as an outcome. With smoking, we don't take that sophisticated science that we know and apply it to our patients. We just say quit without giving them instructions, giving them a timeline, giving them anything, right? They may get some free patches, and that's fantastic. I love the quit line, but even those are tailored in an equal fashion without equitably understanding who this patient is and how bad their nicotine addiction is and how much longer they will need. You can't just copy and paste because it's gonna fail a lot of patients. This is one of the reasons when they come to my clinic, what I'm undoing is a lot of their, I've tried it all, Dr. G. Well, have you been taught how it was supposed to work, right? And they usually haven't, it's not their fault, so that's what we go over. So, that, what I just go over is called smoking topography. So this is my interventions in the clinic. How many, I'm gonna assume a lot of you all in this audience are not clinicians, and that if you are, I apologize, but let's just make sure that you know, we're all on the same uh, ground. But what I do to help patients quit smoking is my first, because this is a chronic disease model, right? First step is identify how we can have chronic touch points. In a chronic disease model for certain diseases, that make, that's easy to understand, right? If you have high blood pressure, I want you to take a sphygma manometer and, or a blood pressure cuff, squeeze your arm ever so often the, uh, during the week, and get back to me with those numbers. So I can make sure the blood pressure medications are working. Also call my clinic if you're having any side effects, chronic touch points, right? And some frequency return back to clinic. 
Same thing with uh, diabetes management, right? Same thing with COPD management, same thing with asthma management. You're telling them how they can come back to you so you can understand if the medications are working, if there's side effects, and what's happening. In smoking, what do we have, right? So every patient who leaves will either leave knowing they're gonna be calling the quit number or they're gonna be leave calling our clinic. Once a week, we reach out to all of our patients. Since July 2018, we have a cohort of 153 patients. And yes, my nurses, myself, and others, as well as the quit line, contacts them once a week. Because we need to reaffirm our strategies. And especially for those patients who smoke three packs a day and are wondering why their nicotine patch is still not kicking in, you have to remind them, it will take time. Your patch is not working because it needs a longer time to really kick in. There's a lot that's going on in your mesolimbic area. We don't say that language, we use a language that's more appropriate for the every patient, but that's what we try to remind them. Then strategies two and three, and this is pharmacological agents. These are agents meant to take the ambivalence a patient is experiencing. Ambivalence implies, and this happens a lot for every patient who has an emotion linked to their mesolimbic area. Ambivalence implies that I want to stop doing this action, but I also cannot see myself without ever doing that action. Think about dieting, right? You're like, yeah, I can totally diet, but can I really live without those Oreos? You may say in some moment, I can totally live without them. Then you walk by that cabin and you're like, you know what, maybe not. Ambivalence is what every person who smokes goes through. They want to quit, but they also can't see themselves without quitting, right? So your job with these pharmacological agents is to tilt the scale where they feel so much more confident to be able to quit. And the way we use that is through dichotomizing the FDA-approved agents into controllers versus relievers. And for my pulmonary friends, this analogy makes sense. Controllers means you're using it every day. It means you're using your varenicline or your bupropion or your patch because they are either going to the nicotine receptors and blocking them, they're either taking them down or they're blocking the dopamine signal that happens once they're stimulated. They're doing it every day. And I already told you, if you smoke for more than 10 years, you have more nicotine receptors than there are stars in the galaxy. So guess what? They may take some time. Relievers or rescue meds are meant to do exactly what they sound. When the craving is so bad because you're in an environment, right? Say your friends are smoking at the card game, you're breathing in the secondhand smoke, you're hearing the lighting of the cigarette, your cues, your sensory cues are overwhelmed. You know what? You also had a really bad day, so your anxiety is really revved up and you want to smoke. Yeah, your craving to smoke is gonna be extrinsically high. So what I ask patients is, grab your nicotine relief product, right? These are nicotine replacement therapies that provide a quick blast of nicotine, your spray, your gum, your lozenges. What I will say to them though is, it will never be as efficient as the cigarette, right? All of them, for instance, go through the venous return system, right? If you think about that, that means they have to go by the liver, half of that nicotine gets metabolized by the time it gets to your brain. It's also not chemically enhanced. So these weapons right off the bat are inferior to the cigarette, where the cigarette gets chemically enhanced gets into your lungs, right into the artery, right, into the heart, and gets blasted to the brain. It hasn't even gone to the liver to be metabolized. So the cigarette has a huge advantage over us. So I tell patients, use whatever you think you need to use in order to try to walk away from the cigarette, if not reduce how much you smoke of that cigarette. My first month goal with every patient is really not quit quitting, and it's really not, right, because it's unfair to them if I say you gotta quit within a month. No, you create realistic timelines for them. Usually my first month goal isn't even use smoke less cigarettes. It's usually, can you smoke less of that cigarette? If these medications, especially the controllers, start working, every patient during our touch points will begin to tell you, I only needed two puffs of that cigarette and I was able to put it out. If they use Chantex, the number one symptom they begin to tell me by the end of the month is like, I get really nauseous. I'm like, when do you get nauseous? Oh, when I smoke a cigarette, I was like, yeah. Because remember what you, when you were 13 and you began smoking, that sensation you had, nausea, usually that's the biggest symptom they get. Right, that's what you're experiencing again because your body is quote unquote rejecting the cigarette, right? Because you're taking away those nicotine receptors. So you want to hear what they're doing and then at the same time taking account of why and when they're still smoking. So being conscious of time, I'm going to go through these next slides pretty quickly. But these medications do work. The appropriate odds ratio against a placebo, it's 2.1 to get someone to quit smoking. These are Cochrane reviews. Varenicline's one of the best controllers out there. Yes, I did put it up there. So I'm embargoed, but I will let a little bit of the cat out of the bag. When the new guidelines from the American Thoracic Society come out that I'm an author on, the international guidelines will say the varenicline has class A evidence and is the most superior controller that we have. I mean, it's gonna be a strong push to say, but for a majority of patients, and I say this because we just, a lot of healthcare professionals do not take the time to really go through a 45 minute conversation with patients who smoke and learn their smoking topography, and it's not their fault. We have a system that doesn't allow that. So by default, a lot of us have, you know, the evidence is really overwhelming that varenicline will get patients to quit smoking 
faster and more successfully than other agents. So just an FYI, with another good blessing, because you may say, well, that's not cost effective. Varenicline is very expensive. Let's go in generic, December 1st, 2020. So we have about a year. This is huge. It's also why you're seeing a lot of Chintex commercials, right? Because they're trying to get as much buck left before it switches over to generic. Nicotine patches work, 1.9. I brought this up earlier. And patches do work, right? So use that quit number if that's the only resource your patients can have. Don't use it as a standalone. I always use a quit number in conjunction with myself. I'm gonna to talk to the patient, I'm gonna bring them back, we're gonna have conversations. But the patches work, but they always take time. That's what you have to talk to your patients about, right? For a really aggressive nicotine addicted patients, it could take months before they really feel the effect. Gum, lozenges, yes, they work too, even as standalone. The nicotine nasal spray is actually a really great product because while even though it goes through the venous return system, that really big blast of nicotine through the nasal spray mimics the pharmacokinetics of the cigarette to some extent. Not as, doesn't get as high as a concentration and it is not chemically enhanced. But patients do find the ability to quit even just using the nicotine nasal spray without a controller medication. The challenge with this is, so tobacco always does this, if you find a successful product, you put as much red tape around it. It's the only nicotine replacement therapy that needs a doctor's prescription, right? So that's frustrating, and it costs about $50 a bottle. It's used in as used needed medication, so for some patients they don't mind because they'd be saved, well, I may not refill for some time, but for others, it's, you know, it breaks their bank with that. So these work. Last thing I'm gonna go over is just motivational interviewing, but really it's meant to tell you what to expect from a patient who smokes because they are going through ambivalence. Even though they're coming to you and they want to say they smoke, they're going to come up with a lot of strategies to tell you why they can't. And so what I tell every healthcare professional is just to be prepared for that. If you're implementing the chronic disease model, you can't stop because a patient's like, I don't think I'm going to be able to do it. Because letting them still smoke, you're letting them down, right? I get that smoking provides a benefit, but you know, from my standpoint, I need to manage it. I'm not trying to sound patriarchal. I'm still going to tell my patients, can you just do Strategy one, just go pick up the medication and try it. I'm not asking you to quit the cigarette, just start taking the medication, see what you can do. Right, so all of these strategies are what patients will come through in order to begin to sabotage your plan. The decatastrophization de strategy, I won't be able to handle it. Cigarettes keep me calm. Well, you talk to them. The strategy that really works well to rebuttal with these ways of putting uh, your plan down, the approach avoidance, the escape strategy, which one of the subgroups is a sabotage, like I've tried that before, it doesn't work. Usually the doesn't work is just because it wasn't explained how it was going to work. I tried Varenicline for a week and I didn't quit smoking. I was like, all right, well that's, I gotta try longer. You smoke four packs a day, you need a longer time with this, right? Once they get that message though, they're usually are reaffirmed and reassured. They're like, all right, if it's just chronicity that I need, I can do that. I, did, I thought it was supposed to work overnight, right? It is kind of a failure on our end as healthcare professionals to really appropriately tell patients timeline and what to expect. So I always talk about the implementation thinking versus goal-directed thinking. You all here are successful in a variety of ways, but I imagine you did not wake up when you were 16, Sam, I don't think you woke up and say, I'm gonna to go to the School of Public Health. You woke up and you're like, well, I gotta first, I wanna get there, that's your goal, but you did implementation strategies, right? You're like, well, first I gotta finish high school, then I gotta finish college, right? Then I gotta work with some research level, and then I'm gonna get into it, right? Those are step-by-step -step strategies to get to a goal. Goal-directed is more just binary, like I'm gonna quit smoking. If you just, if that's all your patient says, you're setting them up for failure if you haven't flushed out, well, how are you gonna achieve that? And I say that because that failure happens a lot. That's why that patient said, I can quit smoking. It's easy, I've done it thousands of times. So you do implementation thinking. You talk about goals that you want them to achieve because quitting smoking will be the hardest thing they ever do and you already know it's gonna be hard because of where it acts in the brain, right? The prefrontal cortex with the mesolimbic area being highly impacted. So you go through steps. Right? Goal directed is like, I'm gonna quit, how? By stopping smoking. It's not really a plan, right? Because you're setting them up for failure. You already learned how aggressive this nicotine addiction can be. Implementation strategy is, I'm gonna quit smoking. All right, that's fine. How? Well, I'm gonna call the quit number. Or I'm gonna go pick up this prescription that Dr. G just prescribed me. I'm gonna take the medication. I'm gonna call the clinic the following week to tell them if I'm, how I'm doing, any side effects with the medication, right? These are steps. One thing I did not say is give me a quit date, right? I really, I know it's part of the five A's, which will go away in May of 2020, but I don't go that with them because I don't have a crystal ball. And since I don't have a, I have some surrogates to give me some insight into their smoking topography that gives me a surrogate to their nicotine addiction, I still have struggled to know if that's gonna be accurate. So I don't set them up for failure because that's usually what happens if you set quit dates. I usually tell them within a year, I think we can get you to stop smoking. 
That's what I usually give them, is that cushion. And you're like, that sounds a long time. That, how does that, because maybe it's biased from my own clinic, I get the patients who smoke for you know, more than five decades, who smoke close to a pack, if not more a day. So it's gonna be unrealistic to give them a goal of like six or three months. That's not going to work, and they've tried that before. And a lot of it is because you have to understand the gravity of their chronic disease. So it's implementation strategies that you're working with them and you keep reminding them, keep reaffirming with them. One of my patients for the last year and a half has quit four times and has relapsed because of the anxiety and depression that she experiences out in the real world when her son got, when her son got killed in a homicide and then when she lost her husband, right? She went back to smoking, right? I didn't go over these a little bit more, but nicotine works on those acetylcholine receptors that blunts depressive symptoms, that blunts stress, right? It's a really good anxiolytic. Right, and it does end, and that's why a lot of patients tend to smoke for depression and anxiety purposes. Schizophrenics, by the way, nicotine on the alpha-4, beta-2, that one patient earlier, alpha-4, beta-2 acetylcholine receptor creates hallucinations. If you blunt it with a nicotine, it stops it. So a lot of patients with schizophrenia begin to smoke pretty aggressively to blunt the hallucinations that they experience. Again, know your patient and understand why they're smoking. So that's where I'm gonna leave you guys with. If you guys wanna ever refer patients to me, great, tobacco at jhmi.edu. If you just want to email me, you can. I, this email comes to my inbox, so you can email to that with any questions, concerns. But leaving here today, I know I talked a lot about combustible cigarettes. We're facing the same epidemic issues with electronic cigarettes. At the end of the day, patients who smoke, smoke for a reason. And that reason, unfortunately, is likely to create an addiction that they will have for their lifetime. If they're able to quit cold turkey, there might be other intrinsic forces that are helping them to quit. But with the electronic cigarettes, all bets are off because even those patients who may have variances in their CYP286, their bodies have never seen the amount of nicotine they're getting in. If you think about patients who smoke traditional combustible cigarettes, they took a puff or two and call it a day. One e-cigarette puff has about the equivalent of a pack, right? So these kids are going and getting really rewired really quickly. It is tough. All that said and done, be pro-smoker but anti-smoking. Come at this in a non-judgmental way. And as a community, let's do more because we can help our loved ones quit. That's it, that's all I got. I got five minutes for questions, sorry for running past that 10 minute mark. Uh, thank you so much for great presentation. My name is Bekir Kaplan. I am from uh, I am uh, working at Institute for Global Tobacco Control. My question is about dual use of electronic cigarettes and cigarette only users. Uh, do you observe a difference on nicotine dependence level between cigarette only users and electronic uh, dual users? And also quitting rates in the long term. Is there any difference on quitting rates on cigarette only users and dual users? Yeah. S uh, second question is about do you have similar approach or different approach to poly users or dual users than cigarette only users? Perfect. So your question is a fantastic one. So keep in mind that electronic cigarettes are still in their infancy, right? They've been in the market in the Western Hemisphere since 2007. So the challenge with electronic cigarettes is that smoking topography that I painted out so elegantly well that I can do with every cigarette, I cannot do with an electronic cigarette. I have no idea. And, it, and it's, finding the information about the ingredients and the contents of it is almost impossible. Like Unless you go to the website and go to their stakeholder websites by logging in, you can't get that type of information. So I take down a variety of information, like is it a jewel, is it a vape, like what kind of product do they use, is it a star for instance that comes out of Europe? And I try to guesstimate, but I, my suspicion is that the nicotine that they're getting in from these products is just much more aggressive versus a traditional cigarette. The, the way to get them to quit, I still approach it in the same fashion as a chronic disease targeting nicotine addiction. So I do extrapolate from combustible cigarette literature onto the electronic cigarette. It's just, this is much harder. It's harder for two reasons. One is, we're dealing with the youth. If you guys saw the JAMA pediatric article that came out about varenicline in the 18 to 24 year olds, they're like, I didn't work. Well, the limitation section is actually really good to understand why it didn't work. Is because youth, other than adults, right, have a lot more contextual level influences, right? right? There, are, someone said about like, who are you smoking around, like secondhand smoke, right? You're, the youth are around, like, and these youth were in college where everyone was doing it at the college you were doing, right? You have a lot of competing interests. So even if you're using Vrenicline, you may still want to smoke because everyone is doing it. And the electronic cigarette worlds are playing off that playbook too. So quitting electronic cigarettes is incredibly tough for the youth. And in the adult world. The New England Journal of Medicine publication that came out that compared e-cigarettes to NRTs, which read the editorial to understand why we shouldn't be doing e-cigarettes to quit combustibles, it's not quitting. 
but 80% of those users were still using e-cigarettes at the end of the year. So in my opinion, you just traded one vice for another vice, right? So it's hard to say how to get e-cigarette users off of e-cigarettes, and the quit rates are tough. The 12 patients that I have in my clinic, right? My success rate so far, I've had two patients who were able to quit for three months. One of them with a hypersensitive immunitis, she went back to smoking. Because she's at college, she's like, well, everyone's doing it, I don't want to just stand out. So it, there's a variety of things that make this really challenging right now. Great question, though, and it's, we don't have the greatest of answers. Any other questions? I don't have a uh, question. I have a comment. I don't need that. Comment away. I, I smoked for 27 years. I started off as a back in the day smoker. And you talked about when you depress how the nicotine affects your brain. And I know that I had a uh, series of years where I was chronically depressed. And I smoked more. Mm -hmm. But then I weaned myself off the three packs. But then when I stopped, I stopped, I smoked my last cigarette, November the 16th, 1990. Congratulations. Seven o'clock. I, I didn't want any more. I, I just did not want them. I'm done. Actually, no, that's fantastic. And I applaud you. And there are patients who and, uh, can quit and they can, can do it successfully. And those are patients that I love and I still love them to talk about their stories. And then there's another subgroup of patients that just can't quit. And those are the patients we would need to be mindful of and to try to help them. But I love your story. Your narrative highlighted a variety of things that I brought up before about depression and so forth. So thank you for sharing that. And, and I have to say this. One of the things that I used to do was a lot of self-talk. Mm -hmm. I didn't want the five-inch piece of shredded tobacco controlling my life anymore. Yeah. Yeah, it, uh, there are strategies that I agree, they can help. What we try to do, especially if we have to do a pharmacological agent, is just to grow that willpower. Because for a lot of people, this is a David and Goliath battle that they feel really unprepared to, to put down. So thank you for sharing your story. That's really touching. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? It is 1 o'clock, right? That's when it ends. You guys can have the rest of the day back to you. Here you go. Thank you so much. Okay.